Thank you. Use a we Okay, we're, we're recording now. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to cover the Houston Fire Department personal accountability system. We call it the APAA system. Um, prior to doing that, though, we want to get into um, a bit on how radio communication systems work and why we struggle with that in the fire service. So to start off with, we, we know that NIOSH has investigated every line of duty death since the early 80s. And as a result of those investigations, we know that the uh, five contributing, top five contributing factors for fire ground fatalities are lack of an incident command system, poor risk benefit model, not following SOPs, and accountability issues, and um, communication issues. So what we're looking to resolve or fix or plug holes in when it comes to this accountability system are the communication accountability issues that we strive to, uh, that we struggle with in the fire service. We know that this is not a magic wand. We know that this doesn't fix everything and still comes down to how we operate on the fire ground. And we have to be accountable to ourselves. We have to be accountable to our crews and we have to maintain crew integrity. Uh, this accountability system is not a magic wand. It doesn't fix all the things that we uh, see out on the fire ground. Um, so the other point about this that I want to make sure we cover is that this is not firefighter location. It tells me who's at the incident, but not where you are at. Okay. <clears throat> A little bit on some case studies, though, that are relevant to the topic that we're talking about. First one being Hackensack, New Jersey. And we know that that was some time ago, but the lessons learned here are still relevant. Hackensack had a fire in a Ford dealership fire, Bow Street Trust Building. Crews were going to work on the fire in the attic space. The uh, incident commander outside realized that they had uh, that they he wanted everybody out. He, things were going well. He wanted everybody out. Incident command gets on the radio and calls everybody out of the building. None of the interior crews. Uh, none of the interior crews uh, acknowledged that the incident commander called everybody out of the building and nobody came out of the building. And two and a half minutes after that order to get out of the building, the roof collapsed. When the roof collapsed, three firefighters were killed instantly, and two firefighters were locked in a back room, and they weren't killed in the collapse, but they were running out of air. The lieutenant has a radio, and he starts calling for help. Incident commands out front doesn't hear any of those calls for help multiple attempts from this lieutenant to get that, that message out. Incident commander out front has no idea that that's going on. Somewhere a couple towns over you have uh, somebody that's got a scanner on. They pick up that these two firefighters are calling for help, realize that command does not know that, and they call the dispatch center, they realign, they get to the back room where those two firefighters were, and ultimately, they had lost their lives. They, they, um, they ran out of air. Um, the significant piece in this incident is that that lieutenant was on the right fire ground channel prior to the collapse. He was talking with command. Everything was fine. The collapse takes place, and he knocked his radio off the fire ground channel to a different channel. Because the radio was in scan mode, that officer had the false sense uh, of security thinking that he's still talking to incident command out front because he's hearing all that fire ground traffic. But in that case, we know that wasn't, that wasn't what took place. Because that firefighter got knocked off the, the fire ground channel, that lieutenant got knocked off that fire ground channel, um, all of his calls for help were not to the people that were out in front that could help him. So that was Hackensack. The other one was the Houston incident. And the point that we bring up there is that you had multiple maydays coming in from multiple locations. And as that's going on, command's trying to, to gather all that and manage that. One of the things that we have with this application is a way to capture all those maydays 
and to be able to manage that. The other thing is the uh, wires that melted on one of the firefighters' radios uh, locking open that talk loop. Um, and in, in uh, this case, and with the application that we have, we have a feature that allows you to take that radio and move it to a different channel. The last one being Philly, and in Philly's case, Philly had a incident where um, firefighters were going to work. They were going to um, make an attack on a basement fire. Um, the crew leader, the lieutenant, decided to get his crews up and out. And his firefighter came up and out. He came up and out. But the third firefighter came up and made a wrong turn and got lost above the fire floor. Um, they had uh, a system where if they pushed a button on the system, it would send a message back out to the dispatch center. The dispatch center was flooded with a number of different calls and requests going on. Um, and because of that confusion, um, some of those maydays weren't picked up. Or when they were picked up and transmitted back to command, um, command ended up doing a par realizing that that firefighter was missing. Um, and they went back to go uh, find that firefighter. Um, but uh, the floor had burned through. The, fire burned through the air hose and that's how she died. Prior to that happening, 17 messages were sent out trying to get people's attention, but they were being transmitted on a channel that was not the fire ground channel. So, with this system, we have the ability to see who's on the channels that we're working on. We could tell if somebody's not on the right channel, as what took place in Hackensack. We have the ability to manage multiple maydays that come in in quick succession. Um, and we have the ability to move a radio to a different frequency. And all things that we learned out of some of these previous case studies. A little bit more about how radios work. So when I key up a radio and I transmit, I'm sending out an electromagnetic wave that goes out through the air. That wave has a particular height to it and it has a pulse rate to it. Anything else that's programmed up to see this particular wave come through at this height, at this pulse rate, sucks that message in and it decodes it. Because of that, there are, or that technology, that type of technology is used on multiple different things. That's how we close our garage door, it's how we set off somebody's defibrillator, it's burglar alarm systems, it's a multitude of things that use that. Because multiple types of technology use RF, we have to put it in blocks so that when I key up my radio, I don't shut your garage door. When you shut your garage door, you don't set off my pacemaker. Right? If we are in the fire service, we know <clears throat> public safety is regulated to one of three places. We're either VHF, UHF, or 800. The reason we bring that up is that there's pluses and minuses or advantages and disadvantages based on where you're at in the spectrum. Houston, you're over here in the 800 area. That gives you good in-building penetration. However, one of the things about an 800 system is that that signal doesn't travel very far. Unlike the VHF system, that has that signal travels long and far. Okay? So it depends on where you're at in the spectrum. The behavior of the radio and how it operates changes based on that. Other things that affect RF, anytime we have steel that's anchored down into the ground, if that signal hits, sees that steel, it hits it and it drives down into the ground, it attenuates. The more metal anchored into the ground between you and I, if we're trying to talk to each other, the less likely it is that I'm going to get through to you. Because we've got a lot of concrete and steel anchored into the ground, that signal hits it and drives it down. The other thing that we know is that when we've got something that's got a lot of density to it, like a concrete floor, the signal hits it and bounces underneath it. So for us, a good example of that was our big wall. We had a lot of steel and concrete in the outside wall. As soon as companies got off their apparatus and went inside, we lost communication with them in to talk to them from the parking lot into the building. However, they could stand on one side of that mall and talk to somebody two blocks away on the other side of the mall, and that's because they're underneath this concrete floor and that signal's hitting and bouncing and carrying all the way through. 
And so just understanding your building construction is a big component to how the system, uh, the performance of the system. We also know that the power of the radio is regulated. So a handheld radio is regulated to three to five watts of power. The way I like to, to correlate that for the fire service, think of it in the same context of hydraulics. Your portable radio has three to five watts of GPM power at 35 PSI. Okay. The um, mobile radios, we got 30 GPM of power. Your base stations, your, your dispatch centers, 100 GPM. So depending on the device or the, the, the device that's transmitting, the amount of power it pushes out is differs. A handheld radio is regulated to three to five watts of power at 35 dB. And that's significant because we know we have friction loss pushing that signal out of the building. We know on the 7800 system, three to five watts of power at 35, dB, 35 to 37 dB or 35 to 37 PSI, we have 18 PSI friction loss trying to get that signal out. And a VHS system is much higher. So from a firefighter's perspective, we know that the deeper into a building we get, the less likely it is that my signal is going to be able to get back out to the street. And that's because of this friction loss. All that's dependent upon a good battery. So if your battery is not fully charged, it is not pushing 3 to 5 GPM at 35 PSI. It's pushing something much less than that. Other things that impact us, when we transmit, all radio transmissions come off the top of the antenna and go down and out. Directly underneath that radio is a dead zone. Probably not a big deal with a portable handheld or your mobile radios. But as we start working under radio towers that are 200, 300 feet up in the air, that big dead zone underneath the tower can be pretty significant. Also, we know that the more stuff that gets built up between me and whoever it is I'm trying to talk to or my contact point, the less likely it is that we're going to talk to each other. So maybe not mountains, but billboards and expressways and water towers and buildings and all those things impact the strength of that signal getting across to where it needs to, a radio tower or another uh, mobile radio. Battery power. We know that it takes more power to transmit than it does to receive. So all while my radio may be playing messages coming through the speaker mic and I key up and I think I'm talking to you, if my battery power is really low, I may have enough power to open the speaker mic and play the message, but not enough power to send the message back out. And then uh, the location of the antenna has an impact, right? So this is the performance of the radio when I have the radio out and I'm holding it out and the antenna is facing up. And this is the performance of the radio when I put it in my radio holster, I put my fire coat on, I put my air pack on, and I take that antenna and bury it up against 70% water. Because now that signal will go one way but not the other way. And then building features again. Even though this is a single family residential building, it's metal studs, metal rafters. Right now it's covered in asphalt shingles, brick veneer, drywall on the inside. It looks exactly like the wood frame house that's next door. But we walk into the single family, try to key up, can't get out. Part of that is there's a lot of metal anchored into the ground and all that, mass, all that radio signal hits it and goes down. So a lot of this depends on what type of environment we're operating in. And it's not, it's the physics of how RF works. That's what impacts us. There's no ways to change the physics of how that works. We just have to be aware of it and know when we are up against those things, how we're going to work around it. Okay. And then lastly, uh, trunk systems. And maybe uh, you guys pretty, you understand this pretty well, but in order for this radio to talk to that radio, we have to hit a radio tower. 
So even though I could see you and you could see me and we're both on the same radio channel, we got to both have a, a radio, in order for my signal to talk, my radio to talk to your radio, it has to hit a radio tower that might be two miles down the road. And if I can't hit that radio tower, even though I could see you and you could see me, we're not talking to each other. That's how a trunk radio system works. So the location of where I am to a radio tower has a big impact on the, will, the ability of that radio system to work. Okay? <clears throat> Let me give you just a little bit of an overview of how this system works for Houston. We have a portable radio that's um, issued to everybody by unit and by riding position. Right? Um, one of the things that we've done here is we've tied DC staffing to these radios that are assigned to unit and riding positions so that we also have a name next to it. You key up on that radio, it hits a radio tower, it goes into the radio network, and it goes back to the server that's at the hook. Okay. From there, that signal goes back out. Okay. And we are also picking up information that's on there. So, 